On this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, we are going lion hunting and we are dry ground lion hunting with Cleve Dwyer of Bull Creek Lion Hunts in Nevada. Cleve is one of my favorite guests and probably the, our most generous guest that we have on the podcast. He's, he's offered his time several times for our audience. And in this episode, we are going to take a deep dive into how to select a pack of lion hounds. What we mean is, is when you walk out to the dog lot in the morning and you're getting ready to load up the truck and head out for a day of mountain lion hunting, Cleve has some specific things that he will share with us of the types of dogs that he wants in the truck every time he goes hunting. No two dogs are the same, and Cleve depends on the diversity in his pack to be able to catch those monster toms that they've been catching all winter out there in Nevada. We're going to talk about trail dogs versus swing dogs. He calls them anchor dogs. Cold nose versus hot nose. How tight the pack should be hunting together. We are going to talk about the hazards and the problems of mixing packs. This is a great episode for people who are trying to get the right dogs on the truck, which translates into higher success rate and catching more lions. That's what we're all after, folks. And I know my buddy Kevin Hall is going to be listening to this one. Kevin is the owner of Dogs Are Treed, and they sponsor this podcast. So you should check them out at dogsartreed.com. Get the highest quality gear in the industry. Tie outs, leashes, paws are protected, dogs are hydrated. Give your dogs that extra edge. And you can find it at dogsartreed.com. At checkout on your order, use the promo code HXP20% off and you'll get 20% off of your entire order at dogsartree.com. Also, check out Rough Cut Company at roughcutcompany.com. We've been sharing these things all over our social media pages. I'm telling you, folks, Mother's Day is coming up, and maybe you have a hound hunting mama in your life, and she will absolutely love a laser-engraved, high-detail, quality piece that she can display in her home from Rough Cut Company. Go to roughcutcompany.com. You can see all of their work there. Check out our social media posts. We featured them as the cover photo on our Bulldog episode, so you can check that out. But go to roughcutcompany.com and at checkout, enter the promo code HXP 10% off, and you'll get 10% off your order there. Guys, the Old South Dog Box is rocking, man. I'm telling you, this is a hot episode, and We've got to get the tailgate down. It's time to dump the box. I'm not recording. There. Now we're now the recording's rolling. Ranch yeah, water. Yeah, yeah. So that stuff uh, I thought it was just like marketed by cowboys. I just figured that only barrel racing chicks drank that shit. Oh no, no. There's, there's I'm sure there's a couple other line hunters that drank it too. <laughs> I don't know. I've never had one. Never yeah, done but- it. Becky's not a barrel racer, but she got me onto this. She's like, try those out. She she had some a while back. I'm like, yeah, they're not bad. They kind of got a weird taste, almost like a kind of like a tequila taste, you know? Well, that, I, I know. like yeah. I like tequila. Yeah, tequila is it's good. It's kind of got a different taste. It's good. Yeah, I'm gonna have to try it. Yeah. Is Becky is Becky in the room smiling? Yeah, oh yeah, she is. She's over hey, there. Becky. I don't know, motioning something to me. What? <laughs> <laughs> Come on over here, Becky. No, she says no. She's going to the other room. She won't get on camera. <laughs> Tell Becky to get her hand out from in front of the camera. Yeah, cut it out, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was he just screwed with you. Oh, I thought that was saying. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna see we're gonna see the real side of Becky Dwyer here in just a second. <laughs> the unedited Becky Dwyer. Are you so, man? You guys, there you go. So you guys been killing some good lions, man. Yeah, yeah, we've been killing some good ones. Been, how many? Uh, how many? I mean, you've got what's your biggest this year? One sixty four. What's that? What's your biggest one? One sixty four. Yeah, one sixty four. Killed another one. It was, was one sixty one and a half. And then they killed one as. Uh, 155.4 and then we killed some other ones in there in the 150s but killed some good ones 
So yeah, real big lines. Anything over I mean, 150 is a big line, you know. Yeah, is that a, is that a good year for you guys, Cleve? Uh, that's typical. That's typical. So yeah, about like last year, the year before, it, it's it's about average for us. Mm-hmm. How many how many lines you guys got clients on this year? Um, well, we passed on on some smaller lines, but I think we killed eighteen. So. 18 out of 20 something so it's oh, I was gonna, a, that was gonna be my next question is how many you've caught yeah i don't well that's how many we killed is i, I think 18 but um you know we, we pass on a lot of lot, smaller lines so that's how many we killed was 18 mm -hmm. but we pass on more lines than we kill of course you know pass on females yearlings young toms stuff like that so uh did you have any lines that you were trying to trying to get on and that you just couldn't catch this year? Oh, every year, yeah, every year we have some. Yeah, yeah. But what's that? What, what's that one line that you've been trying to catch this year that you haven't been able to catch? Yeah, he's he's uh, he's one I trailed the other day. He's he's not a big tom. He's he's a smaller tom, maybe 125 pounds, but he's he's quite proficient at outrunning dogs. He he hears them dogs. And he takes off trotting in the opposite mm -hmm. direction. By the time the dogs get there, they're cold trailing his jump track. That's typical for these Nevada lines. These Nevada lines are tough. They're they're good what, at outrunning dogs. So what makes you what makes you keep going after him to try to catch him? Mm, I don't know. He, I know where he is. He's he's typically in the same area. So I I know I got a line track there, so I can go unload and ride a circle or. Sometimes they don't take mules in there and and uh, go in there and you typically strike him. You're going to trail him four or five miles. Last time we trailed him was Friday, and we trailed him right at five miles. And we just we didn't jump him. The wind was just ripping up on top of them ridges, and it got late in the day, and we pulled dogs and rode back to the truck. But he's he's typically in that area, and you can strike him pr pretty pretty regular. Well, the thing I'm getting the thing I'm getting at and trying to get you to admit is mm -hmm. you're you're catching him because he keeps out running you and you want to catch him and you want to work your dogs on him. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to catch up to him. <laughs> nothing nothing personal or nothing. It's just I I know he's there, so it's right. uh, it's it's easy to find him, but yeah, it'd, it'd be it'd be cool to catch up to him cuz he's he's fast. He's He's yeah. a fast little squirt. He can he can run. If, so. if they if you got that one that's always giving you the slip, that's always a step ahead. You know, I don't care whether it's a bear or a, or a coon or whatever. You know, back here you always hear the old stories about the ghost coon. That all came from where the red fern grows. But that one coon that you can't catch, or that one bear that always seems to outrun you. You know, old slew foot, and then you got the mountain lion out there that that just keeps outrunning you. So you just keep going after him. Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those things. So it is personal. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> not, I don't know if it's personal because he's. <laughs> I don't know. There's nothing special about his track. He's not a big line. He's just he's just always there. So, but uh, I would like to, the... look, would like to catch him because he he's kind of hard one to catch. So yeah, take some pictures of him and you just keep educating him is what you're doing. He's getting better. He's getting better every time you run him too. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, he he gets he mistake. gets better every time. He probably learns better than I do. He'll make a mistake though. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, something will happen. Some one of these days, I'll get lucky. I just think it's. I mean, it's cool to catch big lions, and it's cool to it's cool to talk about the ones you catch. But it's also equally important to talk about the ones that we don't catch. You know, but we still keep trying. Oh yeah, yeah. I, it's best if a guy stays transparent to an extent. Well, you know, I brought up the ghost coon type thing, but those kind of stories right there are the ones that that get told around the campfire at the clubhouse and stuff. You know, it's like, man, if you go down to if you go down to Thermal Hollow and you you turn up that you know that branch right there at Thermal Hollow, you'll strike a coon, but you won't catch him. Nobody's ever caught him. You know, nobody. Everybody's got the story about the coon they catch. But the yeah. ones that you can't catch, those are the good stories. It almost becomes like a local challenge type thing, and, and then it becomes personal. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
they they wrote a whole story about it and where the red fern grows. So it's got there's got to be something to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then old Slewfoot. Have you ever heard the song Old Slewfoot? Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard yeah. that before. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. There's something to the ones that you can't catch, but we keep trying to catch them anyway. And they they're just trophies, and when you catch them, they don't have to be big. They don't have to be Boone and Crockett, but. Yeah, I love the I love those stories, man. Those are the greatest stories, really. Yeah, yeah. You come in from hunting and you're just like, man, we got our butts kicked today. But man, did you see what that lion did, or did you see what that bear did? Did you see how the dogs did this or they did that? It's just I I love talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Of course, if you're if you're an outfitter, and I bet your clients don't like talking about those stories, though. No. <laughs> I don't always like talking about it in front of them either. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've talked about that before. We've, we've talked about, I think I was talking to Josh Whitaker, you know, about how, you know, you just want to run every track. You want to run every track because you just want to get your dogs on the ground and hunt, but you can't stop and run every track because you got somebody in the truck that's looking for the lion on the mountain or the bear. You know what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, I pass up more lion tracks in a season than most guys will ever find in a lifetime because I'm after a big Tom, you know? Yeah. And I could, I could chase females and yearlings and stuff and you know, catch three times is what I've catching or four times, but I don't, that's not my objective is to catch right. a small lion, adolescent lion. People come out and spend this kind of money. They want to kill something big and they want to go on with sure. something respectable, a big mature Tom, you know? Mm-hmm. Do you guys do you guys ever kill females? Uh, every now and then, but we we try really really hard not to. I don't I don't really like to. So it's it's bittersweet, you know. A guy goes home with the lion, but it's it's not much fun. So what? Why is that? Why is it just a personal thing for you, Cleve, or is it an expectation thing from your client? Is it the a resource thing where uh, you know I'm trying to wrap my mind around that because. You know, we see different things and, and like, you know, female quotas are on the books for a reason because they want, want you to kill that many. So, I mean, why do you say it's bittersweet? Well, from a conservative standpoint, we don't like to kill them because it's, those are, those are kitten makers. You know, they, they make, they make mountain lines for the future. So whatever you do this year, you're going to pay for it and you're going to find, you're going to feel the results of it two or three years down the road, three years down the road, you're going to pay for it. So if you kill a bunch of females this year, you know, 2024, 20, 2025, you're going to, you're going to feel it. So we try mm -hmm. not to. So every now and then we'll kill one. Most time what happens there is we turn loose on a Tom and dogs get onto a female. And by the time you get up there and sometimes you're out on a rock ledge or in a mine shaft or something, then you can't judge that line well. And, you know, the guy you're taking hunting, he's out of breath and it might be the last day of his hunt and he's amped up. And like, I don't know if it's a small Tom or, you know, a good sized female. And sometimes, you know, you, you hit, it hits the ground and, and you're disappointed. Sometimes you're like, okay, we can, we can deal with that. It's a younger Tom or something, but sometimes it's, it's a female. It's bittersweet. It's, it's not, not as good as if you killed a big mature Tom. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm. I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, you track some of this legislative stuff around or, or whatever, you know, the rules making processes and stuff and the biologists doing these studies and they set these quotas up <clears throat> like, uh, like Georgia right now is going through a deal where the deer and the turkey hunters want to open raccoon hunting up year round and the coon hunters don't want that. And then back, in Indiana, same thing. They, they wanted to open the coon season up year round because they were getting landowner complaints and, and agriculture complaints from ag and all that stuff. And, um, so they wanted to do that. But one of the things that, that the biologists told us, a fur bear biologist, they track how many raccoons were sold each year. Um, and the numbers were dropping and they're like, man, you guys need to kill more raccoons or or we're going to have to allow people to do it other ways. So to bring it all back around, when I start thinking about the female quotas and stuff like that, 
my, my worry with, you know, some guys are just like, absolutely not do not kill the females type thing. But, but if you don't, I wonder how long it will be before, you know, the fish and wildlife and the game and fish managers will, will come up with ways to make sure that those, those females get killed. I've seen it in deer hunting and I've seen it in fur bears. I've seen all of it. I just, I wonder about that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a double-edged sword. That's for sure. That could be yeah. a whole nother podcast. Oh yeah. Yeah. So when you're, when you're headed out, when you're headed out to go lion hunting, when you're, uh, when you're loading everything up, tell me how many dogs are you running at one time? Uh, typically you like to run about six per day. Yeah. So alternating you, back and forth. And how many dogs do you have on your lot? Uh, well, right now I've only got 11. So, uh, we've had kind of a rough year. We, we lost some good ones. So, um, my brother's got 14, I think, but, yeah. uh, 14 or 13. But, so how do you, how do you decide what dogs you're going to take each day? Well, if you're hunting drive down lines, you, you always make sure you got a couple cold nose strike dogs in there. If, uh, if you don't have a cold nose strike dog, you're probably not going to do very good hunting drag on lines. Mm -hmm. you, you can, you can get by with dragon roads. Like we've talked about, you know, I think we did a podcast about that Yeah, and you yeah. can get by with that. But if you don't have a good strike dog or several of them, we'd like to have four or five out of a pack of six, at least four or five need to be good strike dogs and a couple pups that are coming on. You need to have that because there's a lot of this country. You can't see a track in. And if you don't have a good cold nose strike dog, you're going to be walking over a lot of line tracks, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe two or three tracks a day. And those could be tracks that you could have, you could have trailed. So that's the main thing. And then of course you want a trail dog, but most of the dogs cold nose and he strikes, he's going to be a good trail dog too. And then the treeing aspect is, is, is important. Don't get me wrong, but it's the least of our, concerns as being a major attribute to a good line dog drag ground line dog <clears throat> our trees here in, in nevada aren't aren't real tall and 40 percent of the lines we're catching are in rock piles on a mine sh or on on a ledge or in a mine shaft or mm -hmm. a cave or crevice or something so we don't have to have a great tree dog but we have to have a good strike dog it's cold nosed and something that'll stick with the track all day long 10, 12 hour a day, you know, and just sucking up dust all day long, just hammering away on it. So that's the main, so, that's the main thing we're looking for. When you, when you use the term tree dog, I, it's all subjective to, to me. I think, I think sometime we all need to come up with a universal language book for what different terms mean. But the problem with that is the different regions you go to, it means different things. But, you know, if you take a, like a coon hunter, a lot of guys were like, oh, I want a tree dog. I love a tree dog. And and then if you talk to, uh, you know, a dry ground hunter like you, then then it's not your top priority. <clears throat> but I think a lot of times that term gets misunderstood by the, it's not just bellied up and, and blowing the top out of the tree at 140 barks a minute. It's, it's you know, a dog that's accurate, a dog that can locate. Well, I'm talking coon dog here and, and one that's going to have a coon, the high, high percentage of the time. To me, that's what a tree dog is. And how's it different for when you say a tree dog in Nevada, what do you mean? I don't, I don't need a, a dog that's barking hundred barks a minute. I need a dog that's barking 20 barks a minute, maybe. Because I don't want him to bark all that much. Main reason is that takes a lot of energy for that dog to bark there for five or six hours. I might not get there for five or six hours. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot of energy for that dog to bark constantly. So if he just barking, I don't know, 20 barks a minute, that's good. And that don't wear him out. That lion jumps, he's still got enough energy to catch that lion again and he's not completely wore out another thing is that dog there's a good chance that dog's climbing that tree 
because our trees out here, a dog can climb them pretty easy. Your typical line is only up the tree about 15 to 18 feet at the highest. So that dog, most of the time, one of those six dogs, at least probably two out of six dogs that are on that tree are up there right in that line's face. Well, that dog gets up there and he falls out of the tree. He right. hits the ground, shakes his head and climbs back up there. He does that a dozen times before you get there. He's going to be sore and tired. Plus he's screaming at the top of his lungs. That don't help him on his energy levels. So I don't like a dog that's barking constant. I, I kind of like them to kind of reserve themselves on the barking some. So um, that's, that's one thing that does make a difference. If you got a dog that's just been hammering away all day long, the next day you look at him, he's going to be tired. That took a lot out of him. Yeah. You know, that's, that's like going out there and getting in a fist fight all night and screaming at the top of your lungs <laughs> the next day you're going to be tired. So, Yeah. Do that every night. Doesn't take you long before you don't want to be any more fist fights. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So unless you're making a lot of money doing it. So, so let's get back. I, I want to ask you some more questions about how you pick that, pick that pack. And maybe it goes farther back than that. Maybe it goes to, you know, what you end up keeping, um, uh, for your line pack altogether. But, um, when, when you talk about having a, a, a pack of lion dogs, are you looking for dogs that are stronger in one area and make up for weaknesses in other areas? Or are you, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is <clears throat> do you just have dogs you keep around to throw in on a track to, to put some pressure on a lion. Yeah, or do yeah. They need they need to carry they need to carry the weight in all aspects. No, it's 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 tough to find a dog that's going to be a, a nine or a ten and trailing, striking, and treeing. It's it's really tough. So we have we have a couple dogs that they're mainly just trail dogs. They tree too, but they're kind of just they're our anchor dogs. They just hammer down and just trail all day. And when you get to a really tough spot, the other dogs that are cold nosed as well they'll circle back to those dogs and see what they have. You know, them dogs that free up a little more <clears throat> will circle back to those anchor dogs and, and, and make sure that they're, they're still on it. And then they'll take that track from where them anchor dogs are and move it forward again. And uh, those anchor dogs are, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. They're not the one that, you know, they're not the one that gets the credit for catching physically catching up to the line and putting him up a tree or on a ledge. But those are the dogs that, oftentimes do all the grunt work and then mm -hmm. your dog that's not quite as cold nosed he's going to be the one that you know he, he's more he's more well-rounded if you will he he does everything pretty decent and uh but the main thing on that he, he needs to be cold nosed because out here in nevada you know you, you might not be you might not be striking a line every day so if you uh if you want to have a track you need to have something that will strike a, a day and a half two day old track you're not going to catch that two day old lion track you know you're not going to catch up to that line but you need to know that that line is there then you can concentrate your efforts on that so okay so it, if you're not if you're not you need to expand on that a little bit if you know you're not going to catch a two two day old lion track why is it important that you've got a dog dog that can strike that track <laughs> well because if, if if they can strike that track, then you let them dogs trail that, that track for a bit. You get a feel of what that line's doing. You know, they hit him here and hit him there, and he goes through a saddle going north. You say, okay, I know where I'll find him tomorrow. You're not going to catch him today. Mm -hmm. But you know where to unload your mules the next day or the day after that. And you know where he's probably going to drop into what canyon. You've caught enough lines there to know that you're going to find him there and you can read him and you'd read that dog you know you, you kind of read the way he's trailing the way he's striking it everything and say okay that's a that's a two-day old track they're just hitting it here and there and they can move it a little bit and they're trailing it better in the shade than in the sunlight so it's it's probably a two-day old track they're just hitting it in places you know where that line's going to go and then you hit his scratches if it's a tongue you hit his scratches and then you you leapfrog out front the next day unload there and make a circle there. Maybe there's a spring there and water there and you hit him there. And, uh, that, that, that's worth its weight in gold. Having, having dogs like that. You can't always have a bunch of catch dogs. And I'm not saying these dogs are one dimensional, you know, you, it's not like, Oh, we got catch dogs and we got 
cold trail dogs. No, no, they're they do each other's job, but some of them are, are excelling at at parts that the other ones aren't. So okay, so getting back to, I'm gonna break this down a little bit. We got a couple things here that I want to talk about, but yeah. um, getting back to the way your pack is organized you know you talked about your anchor dogs and then you've got your dogs that'll circle back in so are you looking for you know the anchor dogs the slow they're the they're the steady they can make steady progress they're not going to set any speed records for moving the track out but if they get it to a point where it can be moved out your other dogs will circle back in pick it up and move it and have a chance of jumping the lion is that what is that what you're doing yeah, yeah, exactly. So, if, and if uh, it's good enough, they'll take it and they will jump the line. But if they don't and it breaks down, then your anchor dogs come back through, pick up the track again, get it lined out, keep it moving forward, and then your your catch dogs come back in. It just keeps going like that. Is that what you're? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty much like that. You know, those dogs that are a little more warmer nose, they free up a little more. They're gonna line that track out once once you get into better trailing conditions maybe it's mm-hmm. shade maybe it's better moisture in the dirt a little tiny bit of moisture in that dirt subsurface moisture in that dirt that holds that scent well and they they line it out pretty good and 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 sort it out and then that anchor dog he still might be you know eighth of a mile back there he'll catch up to him but when those other dogs have trouble sorting it out again some some of them will sort sort it out and some of them will circle back to that anchor dog and and then they'll redo it again and figure out where they made that mistake. And, uh, you know, it's you, you got to have a little bit of both. And you might have two – you might have an anchor dog and a free-up dog out of the same litter, you know. Yeah. And they, they honor – if they honor each other, that's best. Most of the time, them really cold-nosed anchor dogs don't honor the other dogs as much. But those – I was getting ready to say that. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Are they Are they pretty just stubborn and just like – Nope, I'm on the track. You idiots can go blow around and blow around the country all you want, but I know what my job is, and I'm going to stay right here and stay on this track. Yeah, exactly. Atomic bomb could go off, and they'd still be trolling that lion, you know. And they're they're just focused, just hyper focused almost. But, but uh, if you had, yeah. a, would it be safe to say if you had a whole pack of those, you would never catch the lion though? Did you get, did you get the question there? I cut What's, out on you. No, no, you cut out. What's that? Chris? Okay. So, so, but if you had a whole pack, say, say you were just a fanatic, you're like cold nose trail dog, cold nose trail dog. I've got to have all cold nose. Tra-. Would you, how many lions would you not catch? Or would you ever catch any lions at that point? It'd be tough to catch, catch some of the ones that are, that are kind of educated that get up and take off running and trot and ahead of the dogs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely be tougher. So you got to have a little bit of both. But um, but the main thing, if you're going to be tough, trailing tough, dragging on lion tracks, you've got to have you got to have some cold nosed dogs. And uh, those are the ones that really do the grunt work. They they you know just stay on that track and just hammer away on it. And some guys say, oh, I don't like a dog that stands on his head all day. Yeah, so, you come to Nevada, you'd want one. So. Because it's it gets tough, and this this country is dry. And another thing to take into consideration is those dogs that free up a little more. Oftentimes they don't they don't have quite as much heart. It seems like they might be smarter. They're smarter at figuring stuff out. And I, I don't know. Add, that was where I was headed, man. Go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say. They're they're smarter. They're better at figuring things out. They're a little bit smarter, and they're more intuitive to what a mountain lion is going to do. But the anchor dogs, they're typically not as smart, but they have more more heart and just grit to just gut it out and just hammer away. Some of those anchor dogs, you, you have trouble sometimes getting them to water up because they don't want to come pull that track, pull off that track to come water. I got to grab them, pull them over, water them, and then let them go back because some of them will just keep hammering away. And it's like, no, you need to water up. Mm-hmm. You know, you need, you need to get some water in you. So it's a little bit of a little bit of both. The one the type of dog most guys want, whether it's just hunting dry ground occasionally and mostly snow, 
those are the dogs that free up, you know, those are the ones that free up and run ahead and catch that line. And for most guys, that's, that works, but if you're in they're more stuff, sexy. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're, that, you get that dog that, that they're more appealing up and blows through the country and moves a track out and ends up catching that lion. It's a lot more exciting. I mean, I've been, I've, okay. If you come back East and this is a part that I think, um, a lot of coon hunters may not understand, especially from the East here of why you would have a dog like that. There's no reason for, there's, there's no practical reason to have a dog that what you, you know, you said stands on its head back here for a coon hunter. That's, I'm sure there's guys out there that like that, but for me, there's no reason for you to do that. That's not the only coon track on this place. I guarantee it. There's another one's here somewhere. Get your head up off the ground, get through there, go find one you can tree and, and stuff like that. And that also causes a lot of controversy about, you know, we've lost the trailing ability in our dogs. And then the, the old timers will say competition hunters with these hot nosed dogs have run coon hounds and have are running hounds type stuff. And so they don't see the need that you have at your level to have that dog that can do that. I mean, if, if they're in a line track around every, you know, behind every bush and tree where you're at. No, no, there's not. <clears throat> and that's one of those things where guys that might not have as cold nose of dogs, they bring their dogs into some of this tough country trip. That's tough to trail in. They'd make a circle and they'd say, well, there wasn't a line in there. I'm probably going to take my dogs and then I'm going to find a lion. I'm not going to mm -hmm. catch him, but I'm going to find the lion they missed because they got cold nosed dogs. The cold nosed strike dogs make a difference. Yeah. You can't, you, there's a lot of this country you can't see a track in. So you got to trust them dogs to find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, exactly. I, I, I witnessed some of that when I was in Arizona bear hunting. You know, we all thought we had cold nosed dogs. And a lot of bear hunters will talk about having cold nosed dogs in the Appalachian, you know, Appalachian mountains down here. And, um, then when you take those same dogs and you go West and the scenting conditions are different, it's more arid, it's not as much humidity. And so dogs don't understand how much scent they can actually, they're actually going to get on a bear. That's not a, a track. That's actually not that old. And we were rolling down a road and, and we, was Larry Anderson and I were rigging down this road and we just got a little bloop. We looked at each other. It was like, was that a strike? And of course, from our experience, we're like, well, that wasn't good enough to put down on. And so we drove on up the road and guys came up behind us and turned down. The bear was only 150, 200 yards up on the mountainside. But because the conditions were different than what our dogs were used to, they just missed it, you know, and so I look at that and I think about, especially for me, when I travel with the hounds to go different places to hunt, I always take that into consideration. It takes a couple of days to get used to that. And I always wonder about the cold nose versus hot nose debate and wonder a lot of times there are guys out there that say, I got a cold nose dog. Sometimes they're just not smart enough to run a track. Yeah. But sometimes too. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And they're just like, I got cold nose dogs. It's like, no, you got a dumb dog that can't run a track. And, yeah. and they wouldn't be able to run any track, <laughs> but there's also guys that recognize the difference in the need for different, different types of dogs. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a need for them. And, and oftentimes those really cold nosed dogs aren't going to move the track as fast and they're not going to be the one that catches the lion, but he's, he's going to do his part for sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's, it's fascinating Cleve, because when, when I think about when I open my mind and I think about you guys lion hunting in that dry ground area. And I think about the fact that, uh, you know, that cold nose deal is so important to you because, because, like I said, you know, like we've said is there's not a line track behind every bush and you're trying to, trying to figure out where the lines are at and what they're doing. And then I think about me back here with a cold nosed dog. I don't need to know where the coon was, you know, last night or the, you know, four hours ago, he, I'm not trying to write a book about a coon track 
you know, I just want a, a dog that can get in there and get a coon track and get it up and moving and, and do it pretty quick. And then, but that's the competition <clears throat> coon hunter in me too, that, that makes me, that pushes me that way. But the, the work that you guys do is fascinating to me as well, because, you know, like when we talked to Gavin Lippius about leopard hunting in South Africa and the dry arid conditions, that stuff is it's just amazing to me that the, especially when you're hunting with somebody that's kind of mastered the, the trade or, you know, they're, they're well on their way to mastering the trade. Yeah. <clears throat> they recognize it. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's one of those things that the guy figures out what works for his part of the country, what works for his style of hunting. He, he takes it and, and modifies it. Maybe, maybe take something from somebody else and what they do and, and tweak it a little bit and put it into your, your recipe and make it work. But another thing is another type of dog. We don't leave at home is a check dog. You always want to make sure you got a check dog. If you're hunting in the snow, you don't have to worry about it. If you're hunting dry ground, you, it's best to have a, a check dog, at least one check dog per day. A check dog is making sure that you're not trailing Fox because to a lion dog, a gray fox smells real similar to a mountain lion in a hound's mind. And you have some good dogs, damn good dry ground lion dogs, maybe from Montana or Wyoming or Canada, someplace where they don't have a whole lot of gray fox. And he'd be broke and they'd say, oh, man, that's a good broke dog. You bring him to Nevada or Arizona or southern Utah or New Mexico, Texas, California, that dog is going to be considered trashy. Sorry to say that, but it's the truth because he's going to be, he's going to be striking gray Fox and you're going to say, man, they're, they're, they're trailing, they're trailing lion track real hot. Yeah. Well, you always got to have, a, have a check dog and that check dogs, you know, most time one of your old dogs that knows better than trail Fox and they know the difference. They want to trail that Fox. Oftentimes the old dogs do because they say, man, it's so similar to a lion smell and all them young dogs are trailing it and I want to trail it, but, I got a couple, we got a couple little in each pack that'll come back and they kind of look at you with that side eye, like, uh, somebody's going to get in trouble. And them <laughs> dogs are still trailing that Fox and that check dogs there. You better, you better be making some, some decisions quick. And, yeah. uh, that's a, that's a valuable dog to have. Otherwise you're going to be trailing gray Fox throughout the day. And you think, man, yeah, we trailed behind today. And like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you trailed the Fox. <laughs> and it, it can be really tough. <laughs> But, uh, but that's, that's another thing to keep in mind is always have, have a check dog if you can. So Luke Worthington and I always give each other a hard time about having trashy dogs yeah. and, uh, and I, it's totally in jest, but it's still fun, you know, but I guarantee you I'd come out there and, and that's why I just admit that I've got trashy dogs. That way, when I show up and I, I drop my pot liquors out with your dogs and they trash on a Fox, I can just look at you and say, see, I told you they were trashy. Yeah. You know, just <laughs> yeah. take the ego out of it. You don't have to make it, excuses man. for them. Huh? Then you don't have to make excuses. Yeah. I, yeah. I already told you they're trashy. Yeah. Yeah. I told you that they're trashy. They'll run yeah. anything. Yeah. 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 But Luke and I have a good time going back and forth on, on social media and stuff. Every time he posts something, you know, I'll chime in and it'll be like, those trashy dogs caught another one. So we've kind of settled on the fact that he's got the trashiest dogs west of the Mississippi and I've got the trashiest dogs east of the Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. I think yep. he says so that's he likes some big and trashy. <laughs> no, Luke's Luke's turning on. Uh, he's he's been catching several lions out there in Wyoming. Yeah, he's got some good dogs. He can, yeah, has some good dog. He, ha he hunts hard. Yeah, he hunts all the time. Yeah, he's a yeah. hard hunter. Yeah, bobcat, but, coon, lion, everything. See, that's why they're trashy. He hunts everything with them. Those yeah. dudes will run anything. Yeah. All right, so the check dog, and that that is a, that is a good deal. I, it's always fun to be that guy, especially when you got a bunch of other people that are like, "Man, I got a, I got the best, I got a great dog, man. He's something else." And and you know you've got a dead broke check dog, and they get in there and they strike, and your dog comes back out, and they're like, "I guess yours can't smell that one." And it's like, no, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that's not what's going on here, fellas. And sometimes that sometimes that happens when you mix packs because one one pack you know dogs from different packs need to show off to the other pack, yeah. you know, and they they think, oh, watch this. You think you can chase fox? I'll chase a deer. Watch this. So they get in a competition, <laughs> and 
and pretty soon you got a train wreck. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's kind of the hazard. And I've been that guy that's blown up plenty of races when I go different places because, um, you know, when I first time I went hunting with Larry out there, man, I thought I had broke dogs until they see a mule deer starting through the prairie. And it's like, holy crap, what is that? You know, or an elk or a moose, you know, yeah. geez, oh, Pete, they'll, they'll make liars out of you. But, but, that is tough and that's kind of something that is foreign to us because how often do you hunt with other people and you would mix your pack not too often else? not really often no not too much so i don't have have to deal with that too much but when when i do then just got to keep an extra extra eye open because it, it could happen most time it's it's not with your old dog it's it's with your dogs that are coming on strong the ones that are on the payroll the ones that are between two and four years old, two and three yeah. years old, the ones that are really starting to prove themselves. And they're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the king of the mountain. Those are the ones that seem to think they need to really show off. The The younger ones are sometimes, sometimes they're like, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to run with these guys, but the ones that are really superstars at the time, they're the ones that need to need to show off, I guess. But Yeah. See, that's, that's another difference than back here. Cause most of the time, you know, if we get together and we hunt with somebody and we do, it's, you know, I think a lot of people think that we go out and hunt dogs by themselves all the time and you can overdo that as well, but it's always good to get with other people. If you go to a, for a, well, for perfect examples, if you go to a competition coon hunt, you're going to mix your dogs in with different stuff every time. But even if you get together with a buddy to hunt, um, you know, it's, he's bringing a dog, you're bringing a dog. And so now you're mixing it up. And it'll really, yeah. it'll really test, it'll really test, you know, the abilities of your dogs and stuff when you do that. Yeah. So that's just, that's just a common difference between what you're doing. For one thing, you guys, it's not like, you know, I can get together with somebody six or seven miles away and, and go for a hunt and as spread out as y'all are out there, you know, you're looking at an hour and a half, two hours to get to meet up with somebody to, before you even get to the hunting area sometimes. Yeah, literally. Yeah. It's, you know, it's 60 miles between towns on average, 60 miles between each town. There's some towns out here. It's 135 miles between towns. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of nothing in between. So it can, it can be tough to meet up with people. But another, another thing to keep in mind is it seems like dogs that are of the same bloodline, typically hunt together better than dogs that aren't and i mean that's kind of kind of a cliche it's you know oxymoron call it what you want it's obvious but dogs that are bred the same they're it's almost like they're on the same page versus dogs that are not bred the same you know you can have two different strains of dogs that are both good at catching dry ground lions you know two different strains but the dogs that are bred they pretty much share a lot of the same blood. They're going to hunt tighter together than the dogs that aren't, you know, and it makes a difference. It's not, it's gotta be, it's gotta be genetic style. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, because it's not like, Oh, it's, it's, I recognize you. You got to be out of old uncle Versi. So we're, we're family and we'll hunt together. It's not like that. It's the genetic style, the things that, which is a compliment to the breeding practice, you know, the the breeding of the hounds when you're starting to produce dogs of of like style and like mind and all you know traits and all that stuff you're doing something right in your breeding program if you're successful so yeah i can see how that would that would be different you know you take a dog that's that that's got a little bit different style and how he how those dogs could really throw a wrench turn something into a train wreck pretty quick Exactly. It's like you can have a dog that's a little bit too hot nosed for a dry ground line and it don't take much. And that dog has the habit of running ahead, which is good. But if he goes ahead too much, he's going to overrun that track and he blows through that track. And then he has to come back, try to sort it out. So oftentimes he takes some young dogs with him and then they get in that bad habit. And then you got to break them of that because you don't want that. That's mm-hmm. not you know, that's, that's not progress. That's, you're, you're going the wrong direction. So if you have a dog that's say maybe a running dog, 
and he's with a bunch of cold nosed trail dogs. He might help out a little bit, but oftentimes he's going to overrun that track too much. And then he blows through it by 30, 40 yards, 20 yards. He has to circle back, try to find it again. And that's, that's a cluster. Uh, it doesn't help things any. It kind of screws a lot of stuff up. And uh, so you kind of, kind of want, I like my dogs to hunt tight. Like, uh, and like Wiley Carroll said, he said a good pack of dry ground line dogs, you can throw a, you can throw a blanket over them. And I like mm -hmm. that. And uh, they're trailing on the other day. And you look over there on the hillside, you could have thrown a, a 30 foot by 30 foot tarp over them, probably 20 foot by 20 foot tarp over them. And they're just mm -hmm. tight knit and just hammer away like pistons in an engine. They're just hammering away all, all in systematic fashion. And not much is prettier than that, in my opinion. That's that's the way I like them to trail. Then once the track warms up, then I want I want somebody that's a little warmer nose to free up and go out there and, and catch the lion. But in the meantime, they need to be they need to be a team. Mm -hmm. So, how far out? I'm not sure I caught everything there, so I want to make sure I get this. But if you've yeah. got swing dogs, if you've got dogs that are that are swinging out. How far out do you want them away from your, your good trail dogs? How far is too far for you? Mm, hundred yards is further than I want them to be. I don't, maybe a hundred yards is about tops, but, uh, they go any further than that. I don't, I don't really need them that far out. Sometimes mm -hmm. it might help, help catch something more, but if that track goes backwards and that dog starts lining it out, going backwards, then you gotta, then you gotta get ahead, make sure he's going the right direction. It's easier to turn turn dogs around six or seven dogs around while they're all together than it is when they're scattered. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't like them to go too much further than that. Personally, but on the is, same point, you have a colder nosed dog and you got a warmer nosed dog. That colder nosed dog, he's he's probably going to do most of the work trailing into a kill. But if you get you say if you have two dogs trailing into a kill and you got a dog that's more of a free up dog or some guys call a swing dog, warmer nosed, that warmer nosed dog is going to be able to decipher the difference between a three old a three three hour old track and a twenty four hour old track or a three hour old track and a twelve hour old track. He's going to be able to decipher the difference between those two better than a cold nosed dog. That cold nosed dog, he's going to be trailing the. 24 hour old track the 12 hour old track maybe six hour old track and not be able to decipher the difference between the three too much versus that warmer nose dog he'll he'll be able to tell what what one's the freshest and he'll line it out and probably catch your lion on the jump mm -hmm. you know he's going to be the one that's going to jump your lion so that's so one of the differences so your cold trail dogs you really can't tell how old the track is by with with um a cold nosed dog. They run the track pretty much the same all the time. Often, oftentimes, you know, I got one here and he's, he's a big old dog and he's hard to, he's hard to read. It's hard to tell if he's on a day and a half or two day old track or if it's eight hours old, it's really tough. So I just got to watch him. Now I'll let him trail a little bit and he's a little colder nose than these other dogs I got. And I'll let him trail for a while. And if one of them goes over there and starts wagging their tail and they start to strike on it or trying to strike on it, then I'll, I'll say, okay, maybe, maybe it's night old, maybe it's day and a half old. But if he keeps trailing and opening on it and they don't, then there's a good chance that it's two days old. But I'll let him trail it just to see where that lion went. And then I'll find that lion scratch or find that track in some soft dirt. And then after I figure out what direction that lion went, then I'll put a game plan together. And then I know where mm -hmm. to to make my circle ride my mule in that direction. So, but yeah, uh, I want, I want to come back to that part. Cause I think that's an important part, but I got to tell you that that might make me a little bit crazy. If I had a dog that ran a track that was three hours old, the same way that they ran one that's 24 hours old. If, if, if I, if I had only had a few dogs and they all ran tracks like that, that would make it, and it's probably the Eastern coon hunter, you know, we don't have the same tracking conditions type, so we don't have to tolerate that here, but that'd make me a little bit crazy. And, but your, but your swing dogs are 
the ones that actually tell you, you know, that when they pick a track up and they start moving it out, then you can start judging how old a track you got and things like that. Yeah. When those, when those dogs, those free up dogs, when they, they start trailing, then I can, I can gauge the age of that track much better than I could with that anchor dog. That's not, that's something I never thought about. You know, I never thought about that part of it. Yeah. You just kind of watch them. Just sit, sometimes you don't you don't get too close to them. Just sit there on your mule and watch them from the top of a canyon. They they start moving it along and say, "Okay, old anchor dog, he's still back there, kind of pecking away." And these dogs are moving it out, and you'll you'll watch them. Some dogs are more vocal than others, of course. You know, they they all got their own kind of their own personality and their own quirks about them, if you will. Yeah. So how far out, so how far behind would your would your trail dog, your cold nose, your anchor dog that you're calling them, how far behind have you seen them fall? I mean, like if you get to a tree or you're sitting there at a tree and the trick dog's been tree for five hours and you get to the tree and then your your anchor dog comes in? Or I mean, is it that extreme or what are we talking about here? Um now we pretty much just have one and he's a beagle and he'll You'll I catch a line. It. You'll catch I knew a line. One of the Becky's beagles. Oh yeah, yeah, that's her, that's her <laughs> beagle. And he's cold. I mean, he's he's fire cold. That sucker is cold. He, I think he could trail a dinosaur. I think he'd be ice cold. Ice cold. Yeah. Yeah. Ice cold. Ice cold. And uh, have you ever yeah, sometimes him, have you ever passed him on the way to a tree? Yeah, like okay, occasionally. Most time, most time not. But he'll just be packing away. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I, I call him off and you go over there and there's another lion that he was on. Yeah. You know, and it's like, he wasn't honoring the other dogs. He didn't honor them, but he was on a different lion. So I like, think yeah. it was an old, it was an old Bruce Kennedy interview. I was listening to one time watching it on YouTube or something. And he was uh, interviewing Daryl Fry and Daryl was talking about having a cold nosed dog that they would actually, sometimes they would pass him on yeah. the way to a tree. And yeah. they'd have the lion shot out and, or, or, you know, killed and on the ground and be taking pictures. And, and here came the old cold nosed dog into the tree. Yeah. He come trailing on in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, yeah, they, they're not always appealing, but they do have their place. That's for sure. Like that, like that little beagle, I could take him into a place. I think, man, I think that line crossed there, but there's not good scent and conditions. You don't, you know, the scent doesn't hold in there and he'll strike something. And, no, I kind of got to read his tone of his voice because he's still got a little bit of rabbit in him. He likes trailing rabbits. <laughs> and if his voice is real squeaky. You can't blame me that, for that. No, exactly. And that's what he's bred for, you know. If his voice is real squeaky, then I tone him off of it. But if his voice is more deep and not as, not as consistent, you know, and he's kind of yeah. more of a ball mouth on it, I let him trail because it, it's, it's, it's a lion. And I just kind of got to where I can read him, and he's really hard to read. I'll let him yeah. trail it and trail it pretty soon. Other dogs just go over there and start start working it, and they honor him. But I I know that they can tell the difference when he's on fox or rabbit versus when he's on a lion. And mm-hmm. pretty soon, if he's deep barked and he's he's consistent, they'll go over to him, and then I'm like, okay, yeah, they're they're on the lion track, and they let him let them move it until they can see whether they're going frontwards or backwards. Did the other dogs know the difference in his barks? Have they figured it out? I said, have the other dogs, have the other dogs figured out the difference in the tones of his, you know, his barks when he's, when he's open on on track? It's like, uh, what's, what's the dog's name? Hooey. Hooey. Yeah. They're like, uh, Hooey's running a rabbit again. He's going to get his ass beat here in a minute. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, they look at it like that and they, (laughs) they know when he's, they know when he's bullshit and when he's not. Yeah, and they they can tell. And oh, they, getting, they they can tell before I do, you know. But yeah, I can hear it now. Oh, who he's getting ready to ride the lightning, boys! Watch this. He's running a rabbit again. Oh yeah. And most <laughs> time I just these days I just give him one beep if he don't come off. Most time he he comes off of a rabbit. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. yeah. He's he's then he starts sticking to business more. But, <laughs> but if, if I know their their line went into place and I'm like, man, that's gonna be a hard one to strike in there. I take him. Cause he's, he's going to strike it. He's always consider. I, I tell Becky, he's my pony motor. <laughs> you know, he gets, <laughs> he gets the diesel motor running. So yeah. he, he gets it cranking. So 
I, th- that brings up the next thing I was going to ask you about. Um, so if you're, if you're walking into an area and, and you're like, man, like you just said, this is going to be a tough place to find one. We haven't had rain in three weeks and we need to get a line track going. Do you ever just take like a couple cold, your cold start dogs, just walk who in there by himself and just see what he can find. And then if he gets something rolling, then, then you bring other dogs in to help him or how do you normally do that? Cleve? No, I, I take, I take a whole pile of them. So I don't, I don't ever just take him. No, I, I take a pile of them. So. Is it because of the way you hunt? You know, a lot of times remote on mule mules and, or side by sides in the back country, it's just not convenient for you to do that. Or is it just something that you, is there some other reason that you, you, you don't do that? Yeah, I don't, I don't like leaving too many dogs at the truck. They can't learn anything there. Mm-hmm. And if I, even I've got eight or nine, 10 dogs, there's not a whole lot. They're going to screw up. Even if I've got three or four pups, they might play, play around and play grab ass and screw around, but they're not going to screw nothing up. So I like to take, take six or seven at least most times six or seven is about right and uh, that way you got more noses out there looking for mm-hmm. looking for line track just in case who he's on one right. and i'm wondering man i wonder if that's a line track uh, those other ones you know they're they're good strike dogs too they're mm-hmm. don't, i'm not taking nothing away from there they're they're awesome but they're they're needed for sure i was just i don't really like keeping them unless they're a good strike dog like when we're bear hunting and stuff, if we get a if we get a a weak strike, you know, or something like that, then we might turn a, a trail dog in the, to see if they can get it lined out and then try to feed dogs in, like, you know. But a lot of times, like you say, if if you don't if you don't take advantage of it, they're not learning anything. But at the same time, you maybe if you turn the wrong dogs in, then you can blow up a race. So it's not uncommon to to here to kind of feed dogs into a race is your anchor dogs get things lined out when you know it's going the right way and then you feed you feed the fire breathers in or the wrecking crew in to to really get stuff up and and rolling um i was just curious about that because i i'm sure there's got to be times where the trailing conditions may be horrible. The wind may be not in your favor. And that lion's only laying up there a couple hundred yards on a kill. And they just haven't, haven't got to him yet. Or he's traveling between a kill and water, you know, three or 400 yards up a Canyon. So it's just a matter of time. If all who he keeps doing his job and moving that way, then your young dogs are going to figure it out. And they're going to eventually get in on it. Is that, is that kind of what, what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They even if the older dogs kind of blow out of there and young pups are kind of left behind, they have somebody to go to and they go to that anchor dog. Mm-hmm. They can go to him and hang out with him, and and most of the time they're not they're not grouchy dogs. Most of the time they're just so f- hyper focused on trailing, they don't care if that pups hanging out with them or you know yeah. grabbing them on the ass or something. They don't they don't really care. They just so, keep hammering so, away. At what age? I mean, when can you start seeing? These are going to be more of a cold nose dog. These are going to be more of a swing, uh, swing type, tra- you know, track driving, fire breathing type dog. What ages do you start seeing that? Pretty early, or is it? I don't know. It's it's sometimes real early. It's sometimes three or four months. You're, you 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 kind of call it, and you're like, yeah, I think he's going to be a trail dog. I think that's going to be a free up dog. And most time, you're right. I know. With our stuff, it seems like the ones that are kind of stockier and heavier build are going to be more of a trail dog. I don't know if there's some genetic deal there. And mm-hmm. the ones that are a little more skinnier and more more athletic built, they're going to be more of a free up dog. And I don't I don't know how that works, but there's something there that there's there's something you can call on it, and it's been pretty consistent. So I used but to on, be a, on, I used I used to be a free up dog. I'm more of an anchor dog now. I'm a little heavier built. I don't move as fast as I used to. So I'm wondering if there's anything to that in the hound world, you know, for hounds too. But you say that. Probably those buckskins you're drinking. (laughs) You got that right. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I need to switch to ranch water. Yeah, they are. They're good for you. (laughs) Yeah, but buckskins are delicious. Yeah, they are. 
Yeah. Uh, man, you totally derailed me right there, Cleve. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Um, so if you if you if you see a dog that's more of a trail type dog, then you just kind of let them do their thing. You don't really do you do anything to change them to move them ahead to, or do you just let them do their thing and let them work it out on their own, let them develop their own style on their own. Yeah, just let them do their deal. There's whatever's in them. You're not going to be able to change it too much. You, if he's a trail dog, you're not going to be able to do anything to really make him trail faster. That's that's who he is. That's what but have you ever be. seen it the other way? A dog that maybe has a little more potential, but they they stick around and and they're not they're hanging out with the trail dog too much when you know that they ought to be picking it up and and moving ahead. Yeah, sometimes sometimes they'll young dog will be hanging out with that trail dog and then once he figures it out mm -hmm. he says the hell with this i ain't hanging out with that this slow sucker no more i'm gonna go yeah. ahead and free up and, and that's typical you know mostly right. most time it's that that spot in that dog's life when he's turning on and he's he's on the payroll you know he's starting to be on the payroll he's starting to pay the bills and he's starting to catch lines on his own or starting to pull his weight he starts leaving leaving that that anchor dog behind and going doing his own thing. And typically mm -hmm. that's, that's the way they go. So what I'm saying, what I'm hearing you really say here is that you've got certain dogs that are on the payroll payroll. And then you've got some dogs that just have a meal ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some just hammer <laughs> away. And they're just, yeah, they're, and those dogs, they're just hammer away. You'll look at their lips and their lips are typically more raw than the ones that, that free up a little more. Cause they're just, they're they're grinding their freaking nose against the ground for seven or eight hours a day and their lips are raw and the ones that aren't quite as as trail oriented their 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 lips are raw as well but maybe not mm -hmm. quite as much so you, you kind of sort them out but yeah. one thing i don't like is is a dog that overrun the track all right that that was, me i nuts. wanted to hear that too that drives me nuts i hate that especially a dog that overruns a track and he gets to cheerleading and just blabbering and goes and out outruns that track and then he has to come back circle around and sort it out again and like we said earlier he takes sometimes he takes some young dogs with him and oh, that pisses me off but how far is overrunning a track for you because i mean you're talking huge country out there if he's overrunning a track by 30 or 40 feet 30 or 40 yards that's that's too damn much I really? want him to be, yeah, I don't, I don't want to drive around line track. Yeah. That'll, that'll cause you some problems, but you got I mean, Huey yes. bringing up the rear. Yeah. <laughs> you still that need is. those, need those dogs that move that track out consistent and fast, but you don't want them. You don't want them overrunning that track. That'll, that'll cause you some problems. Cause it, what happens is he goes running off, you know, 30, 40 yards and he takes a couple other dogs with him. And then they're, they kind of start doing the same thing and jacking around. Then you got a bunch of tracks there and you got to sort that track out, call them back to where you've seen the last track of that line and get them going again. Most of the time it's, it's where they hit some good scent and they're flying on it. And then they hit a cold spot where there's not good scent and then they just overrun it. And then that, yeah, it drives me nuts. But most time we don't have that problem with our dogs too much. Most time it's, it's dogs that are more racy, more that are maybe, dogs that guys are using for bear and lion both mm -hmm. so they're they want something a little more racy and them dogs that'll pick up their head and run it a little more drift that track a little more mm -hmm. from dogs that drift that track a little more are, are the ones that do that more often so and not i'm not saying i don't like those dogs but there's a time and place for it and they don't need to be drifting track on when they're cold trail and they need to be be keeping that nose to the dirt now once yeah, that line they, jumped, up and jump, they can drift that up. track they can drift yeah. that track here and there, but mm -hmm. uh, they don't need to be drifting that track when that they're cold trailing. All right. So that makes a little more sense. I'm glad you, you brought that up because, you know, a young dog that's out there trying to work out tracks, especially on a jump line, you're going to, you're going to have a dog that over, that's going to overrun. If they're not overrunning something, they're not enthusiastic to be running a track. I mean, who am I to say it, but that's, that's the way, that's the way I feel about it. You know, if I, if I can handle a little track loss here and there, as long as they don't quit, 
I don't want them wrecking the whole thing, but at the same time, and I'm not talking dry ground. I'm just talking about bear hunting and stuff like that. Um, but man, to me, a dog that's not willing to risk and take a few chances here and there, I got to start questioning the dog's driving his heart at that point. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I see where you're coming from, but it's yeah one of those things. If, if, if you got a dog that goes over there and overruns that track and he has to go out there and search, it's like, if you're over here trying to draw a real nice picture and somebody comes over there and scribbles all over that damn thing. Yeah. You know, it's, I can it's just, see how it can be a problem for you. Oh yeah. And then, then you're sorting through a thousand dog tracks Mm -hmm. And looking for part of a lion track, just maybe a pad and two toes. And you're like, damn it, I wish them dogs hadn't done that. There's a place for them to circle out and and look for it when they're when they make a lose, but a legitimate lose, not an overrun part, you know, not where they just overran it and didn't slow down enough. But that's that's not really the training so much. That's the breeding. The dogs that are are bred to slow down sure. a trail and be very methodical. That's that's where that comes into play. You don't have as much problem with with dogs that are bred right. I think maybe the the thing that I, as you talk, and I'm trying to put together something that makes sense in my mind. You know, draw a picture for myself so I can understand it better. Probably the place I've seen it the most is when I'm you know when you're rabbit hunting with beagles, and you've got beagles on the ground, and you see the rabbit come through, and you know it's first circle or whatever, and you see the rabbit come through. And you got these good, good pack dogs who just boom, boom, boom. Like you say, throw a blanket over them and they get to this point. And maybe the, the, the place you saw it was like a mowed trail, you know, and they come that mowed trail. It's not unusual to have a scent loss right there because the terrain changed. And so things start scattering out just a little bit, you know, maybe five feet this way, six feet this way. And then boom, they're back on it. But you get that one dog that comes flying up through there and then hits that grass trail and runs 40 yards the other way and starts barking and carrying on. And he, he ends up, he ends up, uh, you know, blowing, he's, he's just wasted a bunch of time. You've just lost a lot of ground on that rabbit. Is that similar? Yeah. Yeah. Very okay. similar. <laughs> yeah. That's same concept. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Helps me. Yeah. That helps me. That helps me put, put the pieces together in my mind because when once those dogs overrun that track not only are they tracking everything up and kind of screwing stuff up most of the time those dogs that are overrunning it are running around high-headed and they don't have their nose to the ground where it needs to be they have their nose up you know eye level head level and they're just they're running around like a chicken with his head cut off they're not doing any good right they might they might hit that track here and there maybe hit that line scent where he went through the brush and start to drift it and line it out but when it when it's cold trail and it's and they need to they need to come back there and make sure they don't go too too fast so yep the difference i think would be you know you're watching this from maybe another side of the basin you know across the canyon on the opposite side of a canyon where i'm i'm watching it from 20 feet away or 30 feet away as they're coming through. So, you know, I've seen a lot of beagle guys, you know, they'll tone those dogs right back in to get them in tight mm -hmm. back on track and not allow them to do that. But you just have some, you just have some dogs that never get it. Yeah. That's just, that's their instinct. You know, that's, it's, it's something that's really hard to break them from and probably never going to happen because they're, that's their personality. That's their instinct. Maybe the way they're bred, maybe they're just, one out of eight puppies out of that litter and they're the only one that does it but uh yeah that's time it's one of those things that we're hunting lions off mules i like dogs that go left and right i don't mind if a couple are out in front of me in front of the mule that's fine too but i like some that go left and right 30 40 yards up in the rock piles and ledges and underneath them rim rims and stuff that's that's fine but i don't like them too far out yeah yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff, man. Good stuff. Yeah. What else? What else you want to talk about? I guess just that's cracked about up it. another buckskin. Yeah. Yeah. I guess stay hydrated. <laughs> but yeah, those, those, uh, give us, those a line, give us, give us a good line hunting story. What's the toughest, what's the toughest line you caught this year? 
keluar now. Thank you, I guess. That's um, my story. <laughs> there's a bunch that I didn't catch, and you know that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot of good stories. But uh, you're out there yeah. hunting every day, Cleve. Yeah. What's the craziest thing you saw this year while you're out lion hunting? I don't know. I had I had one line that that uh had been killing horses and I I misjudged that track. My wife cut the track and I, I didn't think it was a very big line and and we caught him and he had horse meat in him and that one there proved me wrong because I told her I said I don't think it was a very big line but it's big you know it's big enough and yeah. we caught him and he's one that weighed 161 and a half wow so and I think it's he just keeping his feet tight weird deal he uh he walked through some patches of snow here and there and his his track didn't look huge and his scratch didn't look huge but the ground was froze but he just he didn't look real big but becky went to drop a hunter off at the airport and on the way back she hit this canyon that we've caught lines in before and uh cut that tom track and, and i thought no I'll be dang you know that's that's not a bad tom not a big tom and get up there and he's a slug we killed him and i said i'm weighing that sucker we dragged him out we weren't very far from the road but but another thing is I got outran by a, a pretty good Tom oh, the, you know, three or four days before that. And uh, I I got outran in this really rugged canyon, same canyon where that other Tom that I've been after has been living. They kind of like it there. Uh -huh. and, uh, anyway, this Tom was headed south. And I, I knew he was going get to get, get the jump on me if, if he heard them dogs. But I lucked out. What happened is... I had some dogs that were trailing up this ridge and the wind had blown that track out and I had one dog that's more of a free up dog and he circled out front and uh there's a dog I call Rawhide and he circled out in the front and caught that lion the other dogs I pulled them because I thought well I can go out in front and kind of figure out where that line is going to go and he trailed around to the top of this rim rock and that line was laying in a cave and the wind was whipping like 40 mile an hour grass up on top of this ridge. Like, I think, I think the top of that ridge is 8,200 feet. So it's, it's way up there. Yeah. And we get up there and I could hear a dog barking and get up there. And sure enough, he had that line caught. That line was back in that cave and the wind was blowing. That line couldn't hear that dog. And if it hadn't have been for that wind in that cave, that line would have got the jump on me because he was in, he was in running shape. Yeah. And he was, he was fit. And that dog had him caught, and then I kicked the other dogs out, and they honored him, went to him, and they held him there, and and uh, went to shoot that lion. And my client and I were trying to gather dogs, tie them out of the way, and just before he went to shoot that lion, that lion bailed and went through this rock crevice and went up on top of this ridge and jumped down another one, down to another rock crevice, and and uh, he said, I'll oh, just go ahead and shoot that lion. I said, no, I ain't shooting nobody's lion. I said, get get down here and shoot that sucker. So the dogs didn't jump down over this ledge. It's about seven or eight feet down there. So they kind of stayed up on top. And we jumped down there, and that guy shot that lion about four feet. Nice. Oh, well, I jumped down there, and I, I could see part of a lion's head. And uh, I start looking around. Pretty soon I just see this big old tom head emerge. I thought, wow, yeah, that's that's what we want, you know? And, yeah. And he, he shot that line at about four and a half, five feet, something like that. It wasn't very far. So I had to crawl back down in there, hook a rope onto him, onto the line after he's dead. And then we heaved on him and pulled him out of there. He's a really nice Tom, but it's one of those things. If, if that, if that lion hadn't laid in that cave, if he'd have just been laying out on a hillside or underneath a cedar tree or something, he'd have got the jump on us and heard them dogs from a long time, long ways ago. Yeah. You know, and taking off. So the trot. lion, so the lion was laying back in. He was getting out of the wind, too. Pardon me? I said that lion was probably laying back in that crevice, getting out of the wind as well. Was oh, yeah. Was oh, yeah. Out? Frigid. It was, I think it was 17 or 18 above that day for the high. So it was mm -hmm. cold, cold. And it was, it was about a 40-mile-an-hour wind, constant 40. Ooh. And it was just blowing, blowing that track all over. Them dogs couldn't hardly trail it. But that one dog, he lined it out. He figured out he's smart. He, you know, he's he's not quite as cold, but he's a free up dog, so he's not quite yeah. as cold. But he's he's pretty smart at figuring them out and 
he went yeah. and caught that line. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Got lucky if it hadn't been for that line laying in that cave, it probably wouldn't have caught him. So that's right, man. That's a cool story. Cool story. You've got, a, I know you've got a ton of stories. You're just too, you're too humble to tell them, please. You, I know you're doing stuff out there that you could probably write a book about. Yeah, yeah probably a small book. A small book. How many days do you think you hunted this year? I don't know. Did you keep yeah. track? Uh, no, uh, I don't know. Probably, I don't know. Probably a couple hundred, I guess. So. Well, you're taking notes. I mean, you, you got, I know you take a bunch of notes. You think you hunted a hundred days? I don't know. A couple hundred. I don't know. Some, I don't know. Some, yeah. 150, 200. I don't know. Somewhere in there. I don't, I don't catch, catch one every time we go out, but we, we hunt lions every time we go out. That's all it counts. But, yeah. uh, but yeah, I don't know. We, it's hard telling how many, how many days I have to look on my client records to see how many days I guided, but, um, I don't know. Here lately, we've been going out a couple of days a week. I've been doing some projects on my place here too. And then the wind blows, mm -hmm. we don't go hunting too much, we, especially at five dollars a gallon. Yeah, don't really go too far. But right, but we've been trailing some lines well, here lately. Becky, Becky makes sure that we see all the projects you guys are doing, the dogs running around and stuff like that. That one day you were trying to weld that stuff up, and the dogs were running all over you. And... Yeah, yeah, they don't help much. They get in the way. I got to keep them around because they're my business partners. <laughs> but, but yeah. Well, Cleve, I'm going to wrap it up, man. I appreciate you coming on and talking to us on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully it came out good. Yeah. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. If it won't, we'll call it, I'll call you back and we'll do it again. Yeah. Hopefully the wind, I know the wind was messing with the internet connection. So hopefully that didn't get too spotty. No, nah, I bet it was fine. We'll see. We'll see. But, uh, Cleve, thanks a lot, man. Until next time, you follow your hands and I'll follow mine. Yeah. Adios. <laughs>